Well, welcome back to the Cordell and Cordell and Men's Divorce Podcast. I'm Scott Trout, CEO and Managing Partner of Cordell and Cordell. Twice each week, we bring you information just like this for men before, during, and after divorce, where we're joined by an attorney from Cordell and Cordell to bring you the latest information. And today is no different, but before we get started, I always caution and you know, license limitations. I'm licensed in Missouri, Illinois, and Georgia, my guest in Pennsylvania. So obviously with viewers and listeners around the country and around the world, since we have offices in the UK, we wanna make sure you understand this isn't legal advice. We are simply just trying to educate you and stimulate a conversation between you and your attorney. If you don't have one, we're available for a consultation. Uh, you can check us out on the web at Cordell cordell.com and schedule a consultation there or you can give us a call again 866 dad's law check us out on social media as well as check out for more information on our youtube page it's filled with resources just like this including our virtual town halls where you can go ahead and see uh, for an hour some specific topics facing guys so uh senior litigation partner rick julius is joining us from pittsburgh welcome thank you scott well, let's talk about something, and that is, we haven't, believe it or not, I was just going through our YouTube channel, just kind of going back over the 2020 year, and we've done, gosh, 150 plus podcasts, and we have not talked about the role of children in litigation, particularly their choice, testimony. I know we want to talk all about that, and, and that is a common question is, can my child testify on my behalf, or can they choose who they want to live with? So let's start there. Really, let's break it down. Can kids pick? Well, the big answer is maybe, Scott. It, it's, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It varies from age to age. And one of the biggest problems that, that we see a lot of guys come to us with is an almost simplification of the idea. My kid says, I want to live with me, so make it happen. Or my kid says, I want to live with me, and the judge said no. Or the judge wouldn't hear from the kid. Well, it's, it's just not that simple. You know, most courts are going to look at things like a child's age, maturity level, what the situation is, and why that preference is. Uh, so it's important to have an attorney involved in vetting just how strong that case is when that case is on preference. Yeah, you know, I mean, preference is huge for guys because they always they believe that hey, you know, my child's going to choose me. Um, you know, I was in Georgia and I practiced there. There are some limits where the judge has to follow at a certain age and it's instructive at another, as you point out, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, Missouri, uh, the choice of a child as to their custodial parent is the very last factor to be considered by a judge. So don't know what it's like in Pittsburgh or in Pennsylvania, but I imagine it's pretty similar. Oh, absolutely, Scott. They're gonna take a look at uh, age and maturity level being the biggest thing. What is the... Uh, it, what is the current status of this child? Is it, is it a child that has uh, mental health issues? Is, is there behavioral issues? Are they doing good in school? Uh, what kind of things are going on in this child's life? Is it something as simple as I truly want to live with this other parent because there's something bad going on because I have that preference? Or is it because one parent won't keep the liquor cabinet locked or lets uh, the boyfriend or girlfriend sleep over. That, that can be pretty catastrophic when you get to court and you haven't vetted the appropriateness of that preference with the child as well as what their maturity level is. Yeah, it's huge. That preference of reasons, you know, well, dad lets me stay out till 1 a.m. and mom won't let me. Well, that's a classic where the judge is like, okay, these aren't legitimate, mature decisions, you know, and it does. You have to dig into those and, you know, weigh the differences and the benefits of even thinking about a preference. But that lends itself into, and I've had experience, but very few where the child is a fact witness. And we'll talk a little bit about that and you know, kind of when it's appropriate, is age of determination, maybe walk guys through children as fact witnesses. Yeah, I, absolutely. Even when there's no preference in a case, there's so much that a, a child can testify to assuming they meet the minimum levels of competency. Do they know right from wrong? Do they know fact from fiction? You know, there, there's too many times that children are the only witness to what's going on in another party's household. And we wanna make sure that not only are we vetting that information ahead of getting into a, a trial or hearing, but also that we have a plan in place for addressing any issues that come from that. Is this a child that's going to be subject to the potential impact of trauma? Is it going to be a, a child that 
is going to be able to articulate when they're nervous. It's one thing to articulate uh, you know, thoughts and ideas to a parent when they are in a comfortable setting, but a lot of times that's not the case when you go to court. Even the most comfortable settings in in-camera you know, judicial chambers interviews are not going to be a comfortable setting for a child, especially if they know what's at stake in the hearing. So we want to look at, do we have a plan? Do we meet with uh, their individual counselor? Do we meet with their doctor? Is it, is it something that we have to have a plan in place before, during, and after the testimony to make sure that we mitigate any damage from it? Because a lot of times it is a necessary evil of a custody litigation. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this 28 years and I can count on one hand the number of times we'd actually had a child testify. Uh, and one always comes to mind where, you know, we didn't really think about the plan. It was in a hurry. It's like, you got to put her up there on the stand. So we did. And then all of a sudden it didn't go like we expected. It completely backfired. Child went the entire different direction. You know, it was a classic where the child's trying to tell each parent what they want to hear. And then when, you know, they're forced in chambers with a judge and they're, they, they realize they have to tell the truth that, uh, it doesn't necessarily come out the way we want it. And boy, here we called a child and it hurt us and it really hurt us all the way around. I think that's big. And, and I guess maybe walk through um, how it goes. I mean, many guys think, oh, they're going to put them in the courtroom in front of everyone. Is It's intimidating. It's, you know, it's fearful. What, what happens if they have to actually and have the opportunity to have them testify? So typically in camera, uh, testimony is the way to go, which means it's in chambers with the judge. It's very seldom that a judge will require a, uh, a child to testify in a courtroom. It's even more seldom, uh, especially here in Pennsylvania, that they'd be required to testify in front of a parent. Not to say that it's not impossible, because parents do have the right to confront their accusers if they're being accused of things. Some parents represent themselves in litigation. And, and they don't have a representative that can go in chambers while a child testifies that's qualified to, to keep any alienation or, or any sort of traumatic effects to have happen. So a, a lot of times children will end up testifying in front of a parent. And that's the times where, where the court will heavily discourage it. But it's, again, appropriate to know when it's a key fact to your case that needs to, to get out. The court will take as much caution as they possibly can in mitigating the traumatic effects of testimony of, of kids, but it's not, it's not going to solve all of, the, all of the problems. So there does need to be a plan in place. Typically what's gonna happen is you know, you'll, you'll have a child either appear with a third party um, or as brought by one of the parents. Um, they'll meet with the judicial staff outside uh, of either the courtroom or uh, the judge's chambers. And then the judge's staff will escort them back into the, into the judge's chambers, and the judge will talk to them. Usually it's pretty conversational for the first few minutes, trying to establish rapport, trying to get a, a child comfortable, and then trying to get those questions out that need to be out without uh, doing any emotional damage to the kid. For some dads out there, the coronavirus pandemic has become a pretext to limit access to their children. Other dads have been pushed out of key decisions affecting their children's lives. If you're one of those dads, Cordell & Cordell is here for you, as always, but with expanded services. We can meet you in person or by video conference on weekdays, evenings, or weekends. Our goal is to step up our service to meet your needs now. I mean, it's a tough one. And, you know, even as a practitioner, I proceed with caution. You know, I'm not, we're not trained psychiatrists, psychologists, and how to, you know, minimize the, the tra traumatizing effect on a kid and imagine having to make that choice. It's hard. And that's why getting a guardian involved to perhaps ask the questions rather than, because you don't know how the other side, I've been involved in one where the opposing attorney completely battered the child. And it made it even worse. And they thought they were doing their, their client a service, but it was terrible. Um, so, you know, the guardian ad litem is an option, right? Absolutely. Most jurisdictions have some representative for the child's best interests uh, available to the court, especially when there are those circumstances where 
the potential of doing that harm is much greater than uh, th than a normal case where the, the court will task a guardian ad litem with doing an investigation and reporting to the court what the results of that investigation are, including the interviews with the kid. Uh, so that will supply at least enough information uh, for the court to assess whether or not they absolutely need to hear uh, from that child. I mean, there are plenty of ways to elicit their choice, elicit the facts, you know, as they see them, you know, hey, I saw mom beat dad, or I saw mom yell at dad, or I saw mom drunk, rather than testifying. I mean, you can use an expert. We can get a psychiatrist to come in, or psychologist to come in, meet with the child, right? We can ask the court to do that. Absolutely. Uh, the courts will all have, uh, court appointed uh, professionals that they will get involved in custody cases when the court deems it fit. Some do it as a matter of uh, procedure and almost all cases go through that procedure. Others do it on an as needed basis and you have to motion for that ahead of time. And it's an important decision in the litigation because these things take time and, and to do them effectively, they may take even more time to establish a, a rapport with a child to be able to appropriately report those facts to the court uh, other times they'll need to vet other third party witnesses. You know, there's a, there's a conflict issue of having a treating psychologist or counselor for a child testifying to what could be privileged information from the treatment sessions in court that if forced to testify, they may be forced to withdraw as a treatment provider, or you may end up with a, an argument to quash a subpoena and, a motion for a protective order to prevent such testimony, even as late as the day of trial I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to think, and I, I think of all the cases that I've been done with some element of child testimony, but not real testimony, where I've used an expert, for example, we've really felt that our client's relationship was super strong and the kids really wanted to spend more time with dad. And so what we did is we hired a, a psychologist who would observe dad, observe the kids, have communications. They were not a treating you know, psychologist. They were there to provide an opinion as to the relationship. They've listened to the kids and they can report you know, what the kids said as long as it's, it is a basis for their opinion. That is a far better um, use of child testimony, even parental alienation, I've done that. Now I've also called a uh, an 18 year old to the stand when it dealt with parental alienation. But you really have to kind of weigh the advantages because judges don't want to, at least that's my experience. They don't want to hear from a child. They don't want to be in that position. It's so delicate not to ignore it. I mean, there's a reason the rule exists, right? It's you want to be able to find a way to get it in. Absolutely. It has to be a careful consideration. It has to be a consideration from the very beginning of your legal strategy going into court is do we need this? How much do we need it? How do we use it? And how do we protect against the, the negative aspects of it? Because like I said before, it, it can be an integral part of that uh, litigation if it's done appropriately, but it can also backfire if it's done inappropriately. And you know, judges never forget. Yeah. You know, one area um, of potential getting through and avoiding the kids testifying is teachers. I had a case where I called a teacher uh, who testified that she observed mom pull up to pick up the kids drunk. And it, or visibly, she could smell it. The behavior was erratic. Rather than having the kids testify, who would have clearly, they all said, mom was passed out when we got home. She was drinking when she got there. She had a beer can in the car. You can get a teacher to testify, right? Absolutely. At any time you're using child testimony, you should always have corroborating or alternative witnesses, especially to those important facts. You need to look at every situation uh, that's being testified to and find out, are there other people that witnessed this and what are they going to say? One important mistake that attorneys make in going into and calling witnesses in, in custody court is not appropriately interviewing those witnesses or, or gaining the corroborating information. It's, it's time consuming and, and it's tedious a lot of times to contact whether it's five, six, seven individuals that all saw the same incident mm -hmm. and determining which one of those people make the best witness or could corroborate other testimony in all of it, because you are going to have limited time when you're before the judge to be able to put your best case forward. And it doesn't always mean 
taking the first witness or, or maybe the, the closest person to the situation. It involves finding the best witness who can testify mm -hmm. and, and appropriately describe the incident. Yeah, the best witness that makes the judge the, the most comfortable. And which leads into the kind of the final idea is court appointed experts, someone that's either on staff, like locally, we have what's called uh, domestic relations services. They are filled with social workers who help facilitate the uh, custody and parenting plans that help mediate differences. Judges, I can tell you, 100% uh, will trust what these, you know, domestic relations services individuals say. They trust them. They feel comfortable with them. They'd rather have them interview the kids and hear about it. And uh, I don't know what your experience is in Pennsylvania. Yeah, we have similar uh, situations in Pennsylvania, most of the time with the court-appointed uh, psychologists and court-appointed GALs. And, and it's incredibly important going into those meetings because so many of the cases can have similarities and, and these folks have so many cases going on at the same time that you have to have a plan going in to differentiate yourself, become a, a likable character to these folks who they can differentiate if the, the opportunity for testimony comes into play. And certainly during the process of generating the report that they're going to issue in all of this. Yeah. You, you know, it's important going into those meetings to know that you can't always just be yourself or, or be cavalier uh, in all of it. You have to have a plan on what this person is there to assess. They're not necessarily your friend, but they do serve a very important role in your case. So I, I've had that situation where offhanded comments or jokes or just, uh, you know, things that seemed benign at the time were taken the wrong way and ended up in a report or really ended up swaying a judge one way or another on a case that just weren't really all that intended to do so. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the moral story, you know, uh, good idea, depends on whether you implement it. It's certainly worthy of a conversation with your attorney. Uh, there are fact witnesses like with kids. They all see what goes on in the family. Uh, it may be to your advantage, but you know, walk cautiously, act cautiously. Absolutely. Yeah. Rick, thank you so much. Obviously, if you're watching, listening, you want to get more information, particularly from Rick, 866-DADS-LONG. You can check him out on the web at cordellcordell.com and other podcasts and, and things that we've done together. It's a big topic. It's an important topic. Continue to tune in. Uh, check us out again across social. Register for our virtual town hall in February where you can log in for an hour, ask questions live, and get answers right there uh, from the Cordell and Cordell panel of attorneys. Until next time, have a great week.